I'm Andy Nidell, and this is Out of the Ether, where I read your most interesting, most controversial, and most insightful comments, and we can all learn a little bit something from the crowd. Robbie Rachid writes, in reply to our coverage of the Palestine Front. Now, we met Robbie in, in Gallipoli, right? He's really cool. Okay. Uh, after the capture of Amman by Anzac on September 25th, 1918, a 6,000-strong Turkish corps evacuated Man. They retreated along the railway northward, hoping to reach Damascus, but their march was cut by General Traitor's Australian light horse units at Wadi El Hammam, and they dug in at Ziza. On the morning of September 28th, an airman dropped a message into the Turkish camp ordering Commander Ali Bey Wahhabi to surrender or be heavily bombed at sunset. Receiving no response, the Australians sent one of their officers to negotiate. He discovered that the Turks were afraid the 10,000 strong Arab Banu Sakhir tribesmen following them since Man would attack them after they surrender their weapons to the Australians and kill them. There was bad blood between the two sides. So the condition for surrender was that the Australians bring a stronger force to protect the Ottomans. The Ottomans convinced the Australians to fight with them if necessary to repel the Arabs if they attacked by night. So two Australian regiments entered the heart of the Ottoman positions. They gathered about the fires, exchanged food, and made chapatis together, stuff like that. The Australians, although outnumbered eight to one, had no worries about their safety. The New Zealand Brigade arrived the next morning at eight o'clock and the Ottomans laid down their arms and were marched to Amman. Well, that was really interesting because we saw at Gallipoli that there was a certain camaraderie at times between the, the uh, Australian and New Zealand soldiers and the Ottoman forces. So it's interesting to see that happening on yet another battlefront. Thanks, Robbie. Oh, and Robbie has another one for us here actually as well. The Barada River bursts from its gorge at the very gates of Damascus. As the Allies advanced from the Jordan, the idea was to isolate Damascus by seizing the Barada Gorge, work over the foothills northwest of Damascus, and hit the road to Holmes to the north. This was the mission of the Australian Mounted Division. On September 30th, 1918, about 3.30 in the afternoon, while Onslow's French regiment was engaged with the enemy south and southwest of the mouth of the gorge, Wilson directed his brigade to its left and reached the gorge about one mile southwest of the village of Dumar. The route was extremely steep and progress was slow, and the Australians, with their six machine guns and their rifles, took up positions on the heights. They saw below them the massed and confused Ottoman enemy troops trying to escape to Baalbek along the 100 meter wide floor of the gorge, crowded not just with troops, but with animals, trucks, and everything. At the same time, the French had taken up a fresh position further west where, under similar conditions, they caught another column of fugitives. German machine guns, operating from the tops of motor lorries and trains, defied their challenge to surrender. And all along the gorge, the shooting began. It was slaughter. The light horsemen, firing with fearful accuracy, shot the column to a standstill and then to silence. For miles, the bed of the gorge was a shambles of wounded or dead Turks and Germans, camels, horses, and mules. This was the biggest ambush on the whole Palestine front, and perhaps of the whole war. All right, Robbie, well, thanks for those two. Now, that one, I did not know that one. Uh, Robbie actually sent that to me um, over the summer, and I read that. That's, uh, I'd be interested to know if there were more similar ambushes like that, say, on the Russian front, that I just don't know about because I don't read Russian or, say, Austrian sources very well. So if anyone has any information about that, please send it in to us. Peter Stickney, in reply to our episode about trucks, writes, An excellent episode! Ac yeah, let me say that again. An excellent episode! Actually, I've been prepping a pitch for flow for just this thing. Our family collection started with our 1918 FWD Model B four-wheel drive, three to five ton truck. It has grown and shrunk since then. It had been in the family since about 1925, building roads and plowing snow in New England until working retirement in 1965. Restored to military condition, and we've been in the display circuit since. Our proudest moment was leading the parade for the Military Vehicles Collectors Club, now Military Vehicle Preservation Association World Convention in 1986. I love that. 
<laughs> okay. Consider the advantages of a truck over a horse team. One, you don't feed a truck when it isn't working. Two, if a truck breaks, a mechanic or blacksmith can fix it. A horse needs a doctor. Three, a severely damaged truck can be repaired, even cannibalizing parts from other trucks. Horses have to be put down. Four, fuel for trucks is more compact, easier to store, and does not attract vermin. Yeah, good point. Five, horses for all their size and strength are very fragile creatures. Mishandling or lack of proper feed will kill a horse, and they are susceptible to disease. Most of all, you can transport trucks more easily over oceans. The casualty rates for horses on transatlantic shipping is appalling, and the ones that arrive alive are in bad shape due to lack of exercise. So, what could a First World War truck do? Most truck use was for logistical hauls between railheads and divisional supply dumps. The usual load weight classes were 2 ton or 3 ton. There were some heavier trucks such as the Mac AC 5.5 and 7.5 tonners, but the medium trucks were much more numerous. A motor transport company generally has 27 cargo trucks and 5 support vehicles. Fuel, repair, headquarters. Whenever possible, a single type of truck was used in the company to make maintenance and supply easier. Typical performance was about 90 miles a day, that's roughly 150 kilometers, at a speed of 10 to 15 miles an hour. Now that does not sound like much, but it's like five times faster than a horse team. Most trucks used by all nations were two-wheel drive. Uh, the US Jeffrey Nash Quad 2-ton and FWD 3-5-ton and the French Latil Artillery Prime Movers were four-wheel drive vehicles. Cabs were open, seats were unsprung, tires were, for the medium and heavy trucks, solid rubber. The pneumatic tire technology of the time was not up to supporting the higher weights of those trucks. This limited top speeds. High speeds on solid tires could cause sections of the tread to blow out and separate from the wheel. Transmissions were, of course, manual, three or four forward speeds. Brakes were contracting bands on the rear wheels only on most trucks. The FWD and Quad had four-wheel braking through the driveline. In any case, the brakes were more suggestions than orders. Most braking was done through down shifting. Steering could tend to be heavy, although some vehicles had gearboxes built into the steering gear to give a mechanical advantage. These solid tires do give a harsh ride, more so now that they've aged. With the road conditions of the time, it didn't make much difference. Outside of a city or a reasonably sized town, roads were not paved and road surfaces were uneven. In Flanders, the ground turned to soft, sticky mud when wet and a truck could sink in it up to its axles. The four-wheel drive trucks generally handled this better. Chains were used to increase traction. It was still possible to get mired. The better the four-wheel drive, the further out you get stuck, right? To give some scale to the use of trucks in the US Army, they had in France 37,000 motor vehicles in total. Of the heavier trucks, there were 17,500 FWD Model Bs built, 3,000 of which were supplied to Britain and about 100 to Russia. 11,900 Jeffrey Nash quads, with a substantial number going to Britain and France. 6,500 Mac ACs, with 2,000 going to Britain. Note that these are full production numbers. About half of this production made it to France, and the remainder was made up of purchases of pretty much every commercial truck type. Peerless, Packard, Federal, Republic, and Autocar for the majority, but there were many manufacturers. Reports by the director of the Motor Transportation Corps at the war's end indicate that without the use of trucks, the American Expeditionary Force would have only been able to support an army of 400,000 men, rather than the 2 million man army it was supporting in November 1918. Well, that was really interesting actually, and it does flesh out what we started talking about during the truck episode. But if you want to see some of those early trucks and actually check out the episode that we filmed in August at the Tank Museum Bovington, you can click right here for that. Um, and something else. <laughs> and goodbye. Uh, see ya.